Bonjour à tous, bonjour à toutes, d'où que vous nous rejoignez pour ce webinaire. C'est un plaisir de vous accueillir sur la plateforme de publier ce que vous payez. Euh, Aujourd'hui, nous avons le plaisir de vous accueillir et en même temps accueillir notre nouveau directeur exécutif Edwin Kouria et partager en même temps avec vous les résultats de l'évaluation à mi-parcours de la mise en œuvre de notre stratégie globale Vision 2025. C'est un plaisir pour nous de vous accueillir dans cette plateforme. Et au fur et à mesure que les participants vont se joindre à nous, je vais vous présenter quelques aspects techniques de la plateforme avant que nous passions directement à l'agenda du jour. Nos échanges vont se dérouler à peu près pour une heure de temps. Cela nous permettra bien sûr de donner la parole au nouveau directeur et ensuite partager avec vous les résultats, les recommandations, les conclusions de cette évaluation à mi-parcours de la vision 2025 de ce que vous payez. Vision que nous avions adoptée à l'Assemblée mondiale de 2019 où la presque totalité des membres de publier ce que et ses partenaires étaient présents pour approuver ensemble ce qui devrait construire nos orientations majeures pour les cinq ans depuis 2019. Donc, c'est un plaisir encore une fois d'avoir tous ces membres, d'où que vous soyez, n'importe quelle coalition, continent, pays d'où vous venez, c'est toujours un plaisir de vous avoir euh, devant nous. Donc, euh, je rappelle que la session sera enregistrée et éventuellement partagée à ceux qui auraient raté cette séance d'échange avec nous. Euh, donc, elle est aussi disponible dans toutes les langues, français, espagnol, arabe, russe. Donc, pour entendre l'interprétation dans la langue que vous voulez, vous avez juste à sélectionner l'icône du globe que vous voyez en bas de la plateforme, en bas de votre écran, vous cliquez dessus et vous choisissez la langue qui correspond à vous. Donc, c'est une sorte de globe que vous voyez et c'est écrit « interprétation » juste en bas à droite de votre écran pour que vous puissiez bien sûr choisir la langue qui correspond euh, à vous. Donc, nous encourageons aussi tout le monde à utiliser la boîte de discussion. La boîte de discussion qui est juste en bas de votre écran aussi vous permettra bien sûr de vous présenter. Nous serons très heureux de savoir qui a participé, d'où il participe. Donc, veuillez bien sûr y mettre votre nom et d'où vous êtes et votre organisation. Cela nous permettra effectivement de, de savoir euh, qui suit euh, cette réunion. Il y a à côté de cette boîte de, euh, de discussion juste à la gauche, vous avez QNR, questions et réponses. Ici, si vous avez des questions, vous avez des commentaires, nous serons heureux de les lire, de les recevoir, de les partager à toute l'assistance. Donc, veuillez écrire vos questions dans votre langue nous nous chargerons bien sûr de la présenter dans la langue qui concerne tous les participants, étant donné que nous avons la traduction et l'interprétation pour tout le monde. Donc, encore une fois, je rappelle que l'objet de cette séance pour nous, c'est d'accueillir le nouveau directeur exécutif de Publier ce que vous Comme vous le savez, Publier ce que vous a recruté un nouveau directeur qui va euh, échanger avec l'ensemble des participants et des partenaires ici présents 
Et parallèlement, nous allons partager avec vous euh, les résultats, les conclusions et les recommandations de l'évaluation à mi-parcours de la stratégie 2025 de pays et notamment sur la façon dont elle a influencé le plan opérationnel du secrétariat pour les deux ans à venir. Parce que la vision 2025 se termine en 2025, il nous reste à peu près deux ans pour la mise en œuvre. Donc, le plan opérationnel du secrétariat international pour les deux ans aussi, les points saillants qui consistent à, vous, à ce, ce, ce plan opérationnel vous seront aussi partagés. Donc, avec votre permission, nous allons commencer. Donc, je rappelle encore une fois que c'est un webinaire qui est dans toutes les langues. Cliquez, si vous venez d'arriver, cliquez sur l'icône avec le bloc. Ça vous permettra de rejoindre dans votre langue. À gauche, vous avez la boîte de discussion où vous pourrez vous présenter, vous donner votre nom, l'organisation et le pays d'où vous venez. Et enfin, à QR, vous allez poser vos questions, vos commentaires que nous allons suivre ensemble et puis les prendre en charge euh, tout de suite. Donc, dans cette matinée ou l'après-midi, ça dépend de la région où vous êtes, euh, nous donnerons la parole au directeur et, qui pourra échanger avec vous et vous pourrez aussi lui poser les questions que vous souhaitez sur les points que vous voulez sur lesquels il revienne. Ensuite, ma collègue Stéphanie va présenter les résultats clés de l'évaluation ainsi que les recommandations euh, qui vont bien sûr guider le plan opérationnel depuis les secours au pays pour 2003-2024. Et enfin, nous aurons des questions-réponses aussi par rapport à, à cette séance-là. Donc, voici un peu à quoi on va s'attendre dans ces échanges tout de suite. Et cela me permettra, bien sûr, de donner euh, maintenant la parole à notre collègue euh, Saswati Swetlina, qui est représentante au niveau du Conseil mondial mais aussi au niveau du conseil d'administration de les ce que vous payez, euh, qui va bien sûr introduire notre directeur exécutif. Sotina, vous avez la parole. Merci. Thank you, Demba, and hello, everyone. My name is Saswati Svetlana, and I coordinate the Mineral Inheritors Rights Association, which is the PWYP India Coalition. Uh, I also sit both on the Global Council, where I represent members in the Asia Pacific, and also on the PWYB board, representing the Global Council there. Uh, on behalf of all the PWYP coalitions, the Global Council, and the board, it is my great pleasure to be able to introduce PWYP's new executive director, Edwin Ikoria, who has been in the role for just over a week now. Edwin has extensive experience collaborating with hundreds of civil society organizations to achieve change. He uh, has been a campaigner with over 20 years experience in leading advocacy efforts to transform governance in Africa to end poverty and save lives. For the last eight years, Edwin has spearheaded one's work on transparency and accountability, most recently as executive director for Africa. Edwin, on behalf of all our members, I would like to wish you a very, very warm welcome to PWYP. Thank you very much. Thank you. We would love to take this opportunity to get to know a bit better by putting to you some of the questions that members have sent in. Uh, well, the first one is, What inspired you to work on transparency and accountability issues? And why do you think it's important in the natural resource sector? Thank you very much, um, uh, colleagues. And thank you for, for, for the introduction. Um, in terms of what inspires me to work in transparency and accountability issues, I think it is very, it's very important to understand that if um, people who are in power are not held accountable, and you put resources in their hands to manage, especially when it comes to the welfare of everybody. If you do not, if you do not demand accountability, it is not natural to work in the interest of the people. I just want to put it out there. It is not a natural process to work in the interest of people. It is more natural to work in your own self-interest. But when there is an accountability mechanism, when it is clear, When people are rock working in a, um, in a transparent way, when the governance framework is clear and it's uh, transparent, then people can demand accountability. And that's the reason why when you think about the 
excess, in fact, in terms of the abundance of resources that exist on earth, and then you compare that with the level of poverty and lack and, and impoverished, uh, uh, the number of impoverished people, you will see there is no, there is, there, it shouldn't be happening. But with transparency and accountability, you are able to demand that people who are in power, who have control over these resources that are abundant, are able to allocate, are able to distribute, are able to put the framework to make sure these resources really better the lives of people. It's actually about people. And so that's why, for me, transparency and accountability and the ecosystem for that to happen, especially in the natural resource space, you know, is a big, I think it's a major factor for anybody who is interested in the end of poverty. And that's why I'm inspired to, to, to be in this sector. Thank you so much. That's really great to hear. Uh, you also mentioned in your recent blog that was published last week that um, you're starting your role at PWYP just as COP27 finishes. Uh, what is your impression of the progress made at COP27 this year and how do you see PWYP's potential to uh, continue to engage in that space? Thank you again. Fantastic question. In fact, for me, one of the biggest lessons or takeaway from COP and the process is that it showed clearly that grassroots mobilization can really make change happen. And what do I mean by that? One of the biggest take out from that place, especially from the global south, is the fact that loss and damage we found its way into the agenda. But not just that, at the end of, the, of, of, of COP, there was a kind of fund that is created for it, even though we know we expect that now, the creation of the fund is not enough, but it actually has to be populated. It has to be, um, you know, filled and, you know, make, make vi made viable. But it just shows that the campaigning, advocacy, the voices of people, you know, the agenda driven by people will get the attention it deserves. That's one key takeaway for me. And that's a key win. But again, in terms of the mixed bag is that the level of ambition we're expecting in terms of the transition out of you know, uh, um, uh, to, to low carbon or non, uh, uh, to major fossil fuel, how, how we transition from that. That agenda, that position did not come out strongly from that. But what is inspiring is that when people come together, when they think something is important, that level of global cooperation to achieve a common agenda, you know, is still something that we all need to celebrate. But we are hoping that in the future COPs, that we can, that the agenda is not just about one side, it's actually about what we think for the collective destiny of humanity. That we, when we think something is key and is important, it really takes the center stage. And we don't move towards the, the, the or we are not driven by the ambitions of the, of, 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 you know, private capital per se. So that's one, that's one of the things I'm taking away from there. First, again, just to reemphasize, mobilization matters, grassroots advocacy matters, it will put the issue of the agenda, right? So, and loss and damage fund was a key result of that. But secondly, is that ambition still needs to be higher. The ambition is not strong enough and publish what you pay has a major role to play in mobilizing voices from across the world to make sure that the agenda that is important, especially as we transition, as we're asking people to transition, you know, from fossil fuel based uh, 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 national resources into things that are more sustainable, that that transition takes the account into account the people who will be affected and, and that they, it is just, it is fair and it is really sustainable. I hope that we can really mobilize to get that done. Thank you. I quite agree to the points that you made and uh, what to me is like, you know, the global solidarity, the strengthening the global solidarity is something that we've been uh, looking into and that's something that that's my takeaway. Uh, and finally, what do you think are some of the biggest uh, opportunities and biggest challenges for PWYP in the next decade? Again, fantastic questions. I really wish we could put these questions into every debate everywhere. One of the first big challenges is that transparency and accountability is not taking the center stage. We have to put it at the center of every development conversation. And so that's one, because whether we like it or not, if we're not accountable, even to the commitments that have been made, especially as the world faces climate emergencies, we will not be able you know, to achieve whatever we want to achieve without the people, change is not possible and that's our change is not sustainable that is one key challenge how do we make the people's voices 
stay at the center of conversations? How do we make transparency and accountability become a mainstream conversation? That's one. Another key uh, uh, challenge that I see is, so beyond making it center stage, it's also about getting um, the voices of people to determine the agenda. As we've seen with loss and damage, it is important to see it going forward. So that publish what you pay as we mobilize voices across the world, the voice of the people, the agenda of the people becomes the agenda of the multilateral system, the agenda of global policymakers. And that's one of the things we want to see. Now, in terms of the opportunity that exists, again, we are in a place where we're in a transition. The whole world is talking about moving from, trans from, from um, fossil fuel-based development into more sustainable sources. The uh, publish what you pay stays at the center of what we call the transition minerals, right? Because many times we are moving from one source of natural resource even to another. How do we make that transition fair? How do we make it just? How do we make sure that the people are at the center? The lives of people are at the center. That is a, these are the big challenges that we have ahead of us. But also to think about them as opportunities because as we transit and the people are placed at the center, we can then see how do we manage a process that puts people, that increases the benefits for people, but also know that tomorrow, this, we must, we live in a world, we live, we live on earth. And if the earth is not, you know, is not doing well, then we cannot do well. So those are the challenges that we have. Those are the opportunities that we get coming. But ultimately being, putting people at the center of everything we do and how that itself can generate the energy and the momentum that we need that is what Publish What You Pay will be able to, uh, will be driving towards in the next decades. And I really hope that you can all join us wherever you are in the world to help push this agenda through. Thank you. Thank you so much, Edwin. It's, it's been a pleasure to get to know you a little better. And uh, we really look forward to continuing our uh, work with you in the coming years. Uh, I would like to hand over now to Stephanie, who will be presenting the uh, summary findings from the midterm strategy review, as well as the Secretariat's 2023-2024 operational plan priorities. Over to you, Steph. Great. Thank you so much, Saswati. Um, and hello to everyone. Uh, as you all know, our current global strategy, Vision 2025, is a five-year strategy that began in January 2020. And in order to understand the progress we're making against our strategic goals, the Global Council commissioned a review this year, which is the midpoint of implementation. Uh, an executive summary of the findings from that review was published and shared in September, and it's going to be shared again now in the chat. The aim of this presentation is to briefly recap the main findings from that review, and also to highlight how those findings have informed the International Secretariat's operational plan for the final two years of implementation over 2023 and 2024. We would really like to hear your questions on either the review findings or the operational plan. So if you do have any, please make sure to post them in the Q&A box uh, so that I and some of my colleagues at the Secretariat can answer them after the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. The midterm strategy review was undertaken by an independent consultant between January and July 2022. The scope of the review encompassed the work of both the International Secretariat and also the National Publish What You Pay coalitions, and it was designed explicitly to inform the next phase of strategy implementation. Information was sourced from numerous documents, including annual reports, thematic policy papers and strategies, public statements, briefings from the annual survey of national coordinators, and many more. In addition, the consultant spoke with 55 members via seven regional focal groups in five languages, as well as a further 34 members, partners, and other stakeholders through one-to-one -one interviews. Next slide, please. So our global strategy is designed around four global goals, to be informed, influential, heard, and connected. So the review provides an assessment of our progress on each one of these goals. 
in order to ensure that the assessment was grounded in issues that are relevant across all 51 coalitions in the movement, the consultant was asked to focus on five thematic areas, contract disclosure, use of data, civic space, gender equality, and the energy transition. Now the review found that we are making good progress on our goals to be informed, heard, and connected, and that we are making some progress on our goal to be influential. And I'm going to go into just a little bit more detail on each of those in the following slides. Um, next slide, please. When it comes to being informed, coalitions have successfully driven important work and results to defend and extend transparency, including securing the disclosure of contracts. For example, Mali and Senegal have made significant steps towards contract transparency, while in Nigeria and Ukraine, progress has been made by introducing laws that require disclosure. The review finds that Publish What You Pay's contribution to these results is likely to have been significant, including via our globally coordinated Disclose the Deal campaign. Next slide, please. When it comes to being influential, we have made some progress in putting transparency to work. The review identified several data use cases, including some that led to positive responses from governments or companies. In Australia, the Publish What You Pay Coalition's campaigns raising concerns that oil and gas projects have financed the military junta in Myanmar led to international oil companies pulling out of the country. While in the Philippines, members identified that EITI data could be useful in helping indigenous communities demand their share of royalty payments from mining on community land. However, the review found that problem-driven analysis rather than data-driven analysis generates more focused advocacy asks and seems to get more traction with decision makers. A number of recommendations emerge from this finding including that we could strengthen our influence by designing analysis with the purpose of supporting specific policy asks and by ensuring strategic communications and advocacy planning accompany our research. Next slide, please. Our goal to be heard focuses on increasing civic space and we have made good progress, although this of course remains an area of ongoing concern. The development of a three-year roadmap in this implementation phase of 2022, 2020 to 2022, has guided our shift from a reactive to a proactive approach, which involved identifying and challenging restrictive environments for civil society. Actions taken by members include bringing evidence to international institutions like the EITI, as in the case of the Philippines, and pressuring companies to cut business relationships with abusive regimes as in the case of investments in Myanmar. Overall, there is evidence that the movement is becoming more confident and active in tackling civic space issues. Members have also been active in defending and widening participation in natural resource governance at the national level. One example of this is pushback by civil society where there have been efforts to reduce their representation on EITI multi-stakeholder groups, for example, in Iraq. Next slide, please. Finally, we are making good progress in connecting and strengthening our movement. The review found that coalitions are on the whole stronger, more diverse and inclusive than the, at the start of the strategy. There has been a strong focus on diversifying coalitions and encouraging cross-country learning, coordination and solidarity. When it comes to gender equality, Publish What You Pay has led highly impactful work to mainstream gender considerations in the EITI, as well as to develop our own global gender policy. This work has also supported efforts to strengthen women's voices within the movement. Major work has taken place to position Publish What You Pay on climate justice and energy transition issues, and there are some strong emerging partnerships with climate organisations as a result of this work. Next slides, please. So based on these findings, the review has identified five recommendations, both for national coalitions and the Secretariat, which are intended to guide prioritization in the next phase of implementation of our strategy. 
So these five recommendations are firstly to strengthen our strategic focus on securing a just transition to a low carbon economy, to anchor our civic space work in shared standards, to continue our campaign for contract disclosure, to facilitate and monitor the uptake of the gender agenda, and finally, to ground relevant advocacy agendas in data analysis. Next slide, please. The next couple of slides will outline how the International Secretariat intends to respond to the review findings and to continue the implementation of our global strategy in its final two years. Our work at the Secretariat will continue to be designed to deliver the six core functions which were identified by members during the development of Vision 2025. These are to support connected advocacy, coordinated advocacy, campaigning, effective coalitions, an effective network, and effective partnerships. Drawing on the recommendations of the Mid-Strategy Review, by 2024, we are aiming to achieve the following for each outcome. Next slide, please. For effective coalitions, by the end of 2024, we will work to ensure that coalitions increasingly have the diversity, skills and resilience to influence extractives governance in the context of a just energy transition. Key targets for the next two years include a year on year increase in the number of women represented in national coalition steering committees, holding at least three regional or global dialogues annually to strengthen member capacity, with at least 50% of participants reporting improved understanding and using the EITI validation process in at least four countries annually to advocate for civic space reforms. For an effective network, by the end of 2024, we will support the movement's regional and global leaders to effectively guide our strategic direction through engagement with members and through global policy implementation. Key targets here include supporting the election of qualified and committed candidates to the EITI International Board and Africa Steering Committee in 2023, active participation by governing body leaders in strategic thematic working groups on the energy transition, and oversight of the post Vision 2025 strategy development process by the Global Council, including reviewing Publish What You Pay's vision, mission, and our theory of change. Under effective partnerships, by the end of 2024, we will ensure a movement that is more influential, sustainable, and visible as a result of strategic collaborations. Key targets include active participation by Publish What You Pay leaders and partners at strategic events, including the EITI Global Conference, the Alternative Mining Endeavours, and the Conferences of the Parties, or COPs, as well as at least three instances by 2024 of policy or practice change resulting from our strategic collaborations with new or existing partners. We are also committed to identifying new donors for the movement, including through joint fundraising with national coalitions. Next slide, please. Under connected advocacy, we will support members to share and learn with each other from their advocacy experiences. Key targets include at least three stories of change being documented and shared annually, increased views of Publish What You Pay web and social media pages, and at least five instances reported annually of members using techniques and approaches that they have learned from peers within the movement. Under coordinated advocacy, we will support members to collaborate transnationally to advance shared advocacy on energy transition, contract transparency, gender justice, and civic space. Key targets include at least five instances annually of joint plans across coalitions to advance strategic priorities, at least three joint statements or advocacy events annually, and the adoption of 75% of our priority policy asks when the next iteration of the EITI standard is adopted next year. And finally, on campaigns, by 2024, we will support members to collectively influence better transition minerals governance, a fair and equitable decline of fossil fuels, and contract transparency. 
Key targets include the endorsement of a transition minerals campaign by the Global Council, with at least 10 coalitions engaged, at least 25 coalitions engaged in the Disclose the Deal campaign, and successful achievement of at least three campaign goals, and scoping and regional campaigning on the fair and equitable decline of fossil fuels. I realise that that is quite a lot of information to be sharing in this short presentation. The full operational plan for the Secretariat is going to be available on our website in five languages in the coming weeks. And we're really looking forward to continuing to work with members around the world to advance our collective vision of a people-centred agenda for the extractive sector. I'll hand back over to Demba now and very much look forward to answering any questions that you have. Thank you. Merci beaucoup Stéphanie, c'est toujours un plaisir de vous entendre et pour l'excellente présentation euh, des résultats clés de l'évaluation à mi-parcours de notre stratégie. Euh, vous remarquerez que beaucoup de choses ont été réalisées et beaucoup d'efforts consentis par vous, par nous, par l'ensemble de nos partenaires qui nous accompagnent tous les jours à réaliser les objectifs que nous avions définis ensemble dans la vision 2025. Euh, C'est beaucoup de choses euh, ont été partagées. Vous avez les liens qui vous permettent déjà d'accéder aux résultats de cette évaluation-là dans la discussion. Cliquez dessus, prenez le temps de les lire. Revenez-nous avec des questions que vous euh, souhaitez que nous éclaircissions encore une fois. Euh, mais déjà, nous avons quelques questions qui sont euh, posées par certains membres Euh, déjà par certains participants qui sont dans la discussion QNR et continuez à poser des questions si vous, vous, avez, euh, vous en avez encore. Alors, euh, les premières questions sont, ont été posées au nouveau directeur. Je vais lui adresser les questions avant de retourner à Stéphanie pour les questions qui euh, vous concernent et éventuellement les autres collègues tels que Joe Badwell qui est le directeur de communication et de campagne de public ce que vous voyez. Certaines questions certainement pourraient être répondues par lui. Mais d'abord, la question vient de Philippe Moutou. Philippe demande, euh, je pose la question en anglais tel qu'il l'a élaboré. In light of what is said that Africa is blessed with critical mineral reserves, which can be vital in ensuring just energy transition, um, what will you aim to achieve in your first 100 days direction for the best interest and benefit for Africa. That question is for Edwin. So what would be your top priorities in the first 100 days, Edwin, in terms of making sure that we transit to a just energy transition? That the first question. And the second one comes from Kay from Madagascar. Um, this is related to activists, defenders, and whistleblowers who are struggling around the world, defending transparency, accountability, and integrity. So what concrete solutions will you recommend governments to implement in order to improve the situation? And what will you do within the movement to support those who are struggling with civic space issues? So this is a question from Madagascar. The last question from Uktam from Tajikistan is there is a risk that the vast growing Chinese investment in extractive sector in Central Asia and Africa can bring to the monopolization of the sector and can decrease of the rate of transparency and accountability. Did you research in your report? So did you research it in your report? And what must be done in terms of these kind of transitional risk. Um, yeah, these are the first three questions. And then I have another list of questions that are coming to you, Stephanie, Joe, and Edwin. But yeah, I'm handing over to Edwin first to answer these first three questions. Thanks. Over hmm. to you, Edwin. OK, um, I don't know if you can hear me now. Um, I will, I will uh, try to attempt the first two, and then I will give Stephanie and Joe, uh, the chance to deal with the last one, which I really think is very well. Um, there seem to be some cross interpretation on the English channel. I don't know how that works. So 
I'm just going to try to do that. I can, I can hear the Arabic one on the English channel. <laughs> okay. Now, so first 100 days, what, 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 what would be my priority? The first, my priority really would be about learning at first, just to basically understand this, the, the, the landscape. Um, 100 days is as is, is long as three months plus, but the key, the key concern for me is just to understand what's really going on in the space, who are the players, where they are, and what is driving their decisions, what is driving their motivations. Especially as a network, we need to know um, kind of the power map, the space, in a way that, that helps us make, more, the, uh, make our advocates, advocates the most effective. And Publish ODP has been doing a great job in the last 20 years. What I would basically be trying to do is to understand that dynamics, to see who are the biggest supporters of Publish What You Pay and, this, and, our, and our network across the world, and then who, what are the biggest uh, obstacles. So that's, that's number one. Um, but in terms of just energy transition, I think it's really, for me, it's really about understanding who are those that are backing it, right? And what is stopping all of the commitments that have been made in that just energy process, uh, just just transition process? What is really stopping progress in that in that in that space? And then to be able to raise the voices of communities. Um, one of the things I'm going to be really focused on is being a spokesperson, you know, for the movement, um, taking the aspirations of the people taking the aspirations of our members wherever they are and really amplifying it in all the platforms that I get so that their issues become the issues that, 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 that uh, you know, uh, policymakers uh, pay attention to. So that those are some of the things I will be doing, but I'll be reaching out to all of you members of the network to just basically understand what's going on first. That's what I'm gonna spend most of my time doing between now and uh, my, the first hundred days. Um, but in terms of improving civic space, I think it is clear that unless we speak out together collectively, um, it is always difficult to get countries or leaders, you know, to, to hear, um, to get criticism. When you criticize the space, when you, when you show that you are monitoring and as citizens that you are asking for accountability, you're gonna get pushback. That, that is not lost on us. And as a movement, I think we've seen a fair share of this from many quarters in many places uh, before. But it is important to see that as we come behind and raise the profile of every case of oppression, of, of, uh, of, of targeted uh, um, you know, prosecution, like we saw in Madagascar recently, you know, unless we come together and raise the voices, you know, these, these things will continue. So the biggest uh, recommendation, of course, policymakers is that is to see that we are not raising our voices or criticizing or blowing the whistle because we are enemies of the state. No, instead, we're trying to prioritize the, the, the people. We're trying to prioritize tr uh, accountability with anybody who is um, eager to keep, uh, keep power, to gain trust, right? would have to listen to the people that they are trying to go, uh, govern. And that's what we keep saying. Uh, and one of the things we'll continue to recommend is to say that to build trust, you need to listen to the people. And we will come together as a community to back all the whistleblowers, to back everybody who is making, um, who is raising their voices to make sure that they are not oppressed or they don't become target of oppression or harassment. And those are the two I will quickly take. I would hand over to Joe and Steph, you know, uh, for, the, for the last uh, question. Thank you. Thanks, Edwin. Um, I'll let Joe uh, respond on the, the question around China. Um, I just wanted to compliment what Edwin was saying, just in terms of the specific um, approach that the Secretariat is taking in our operational plan, and certainly in our, our work plan next year around civic space, is to really try to use the EITI more strategically in that respect. Um, so there is a really clear mechanism, there's a really clear, clear commitment within the EITI that civic space should be respected. Um, I'm sure a lot of people on this call know what that is, that's requirement 1.3, the civil society protocol. Um, and we have been working with um, partners in the Philippines and in Colombia recently to try to leverage our, um, our, our position in the EITI to get accountability and to, to, to make ourselves heard in that space by both governments and companies. Um, and we are uh, you know, looking to continue supporting coalitions in the coming two years uh, that are particularly where they're going through the validation phase because that's a moment to really 
uh, to really make ourselves heard, at least in that space. Um, I think it's a great question, though, from Kay about, you know, how we translate that maybe into a broader um, uh, space, how, how we make that even more effective outside maybe of, of just the EITI implementation. Um, so definitely, you know, I just want to say we, we hear that at the Secretariat. Um, that is something that's just fundamental to, to the successful implementation of our strategy of all of our collective work. Um, and, and I just want to encourage, you know, everyone to, to be continuing to, to engage with each other, with us um, around strategies and ideas for how, how we do continue to do that more effectively. Um, so, Joe, I get to you on, on China. Thanks. Yeah, well, I mean, this is a great question um, and I'll, I'll do my best. Um, and I was lucky enough to meet some of the Publish What You Pay members in Kyrgyzstan recently where this issue came up and also Publish What You Pay members from across Africa at COP who, who um, raised this issue. And the, the role and the, uh, the growth of Chinese investment and Chinese companies in the extractive se sectors significant and I think most of us who have been close to that have seen that that comes with real challenges around transparency and accountability um not even just in terms of getting improvements but actually you know a lot of the uh um the hard fought wins we've had um trying to get them implemented by by some of these companies is, is extremely difficult so um I, I you know I think I think there's sort of I, 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 the first thing to say is this is not a major part of our, our mid-strategy review, um, but we, we are alert um, as a network to, to, the, to the issues of, of Chinese companies overseas. And some of you may have been involved in our discussion um, around scenario planning out of the COVID um, pandemic. Um, and we have a blog available on this on our website. Which uh, which looked at uh, one part of this was looking at the the role of um, of of China particularly globally, and I think there's three things that, that come out of this for publish what you pay, and and some of them might be things we can do within the next strategy, and some of them might be looking further beyond um, 2025, and the first is is really looking at how do we increase our engagement with with companies. Um, and, and going to companies directly. So the, uh, Chinese companies are responsive, but they're responsive in, in, in very specific ways. And are there tactics that we can use in collaboration with Chinese civil society where we don't have fantastic links um, to in increase um, accountability for these companies? Uh, the second is really I, doubling down on, on the need for national, le uh, national legislation that that, that is effective in holding these companies accountable. It comes, becomes even more important when um, you're dealing with companies that um, are harder to, to hold accountable from their, their home jurisdiction. And the third is taking the advantage of the fact that we're, we're a network and, and we have um, lots of members facing, uh, facing these similar issue, issues on China. And, uh, and in Copper uh, last week in, in Egypt, we actually had um, uh, a meeting between Chinese civil society and African civil society to discuss this very topic. And so how can we grow that, those links and the solidarity and the strategy am, among, um, among these civil society groups to, to tackle that issue? I think some of those things are, are things we, we may be able to do in the next two years, and, and a lot of them would be for a longer term strategy. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Joe, for this great insight in China and stuff. So yeah, um, we have around 10 minutes, but yeah, we have, we still have two or three questions. Um, one is from Mongolia, for our members from Mongolia, and they're asking, what's the plan for the next two years to support national platforms in capacity building of local communities to engage actively local authorities, mining companies, and local EITI multi-stakeholder groups. That the question from Mongolia, I think, Stephanie, that could be um, yours as member engagement director, and also our members from the region like um, uh, Emil could provide some comments on the chat to 
we gave some response on that. Another question is from our members in Kyrgyzstan. Um, how will the exchange of experience and best practice be conducted between national and regional coalitions of publisher to pay? And the committee is in past years, there were exchange visits between coalitions, for example, where we learned good experience on AITI promotion, strategy, coalition development, protecting human rights. So will we still have this kind of exchange of experiences and best practices to be conducted between the regions and national coalitions? That's the second question from Kyrgyzstan. And another question for probably for Edwin, could you elaborate where the members should expect support from the secretariat to strengthen or mainstream gender in their work? Or maybe Stephanie or myself, I'm happy also to provide an additional insights on, uh, on that point. And finally, another question is about the re-engagement of Niger and EITI. So I'm happy to respond to that question. But yeah, this is start. Um, my question from Mongolia. Stephanie, do you have any comment on that? Yeah, thank you, Demba, and thanks a lot for, for that question. Um, so I think my response uh, first would be, at the Secretariat, we really take our, our lead from, um, from national coalitions in, in terms of how we're supporting community engagement. Um, so at the Secretariat, we don't necessarily have those direct links uh, with with the communities where national coalitions are working so it's really important that we're working closely through national coalitions to to reach and engage with and support community members um in terms of sort of how how we do that at the secretariat um i i think where we can provide financial support is obviously quite quite important right we can't do our work without funding um, in uh, the next few years, we're implementing quite a big project uh, with funding from the Ford Foundation through their Social Bonds Initiative. Um, that's going to be implemented over a three year period with 13 uh, coalitions around the world in all regions. And there's a specific focus in that program on supporting grassroots communities uh, no, with, with advancing our, our collective agenda. And there's um, a bit of a focus there in that project as well on on gender on on energy transition in particular uh, and there's also an angle there around disability rights as well which is something that's relatively new for us but again like a topic that I think um really resonates with a lot of the communities where where um publish what you pay coalitions are working so that's um that's some of the of, of what we're doing i think the secretariat where we're best placed is is to mobilize those resources to enable the work equally again we're really happy to hear uh, suggestions or ideas about how you know how we can do that more effectively in terms of capacity building more broadly we're definitely really interested in partnering with um you know with our with our other member organizations in the network particularly with with nrgi with oxfam um and and throughout next year we we're going to be working with them on uh, on trainings on webinars that are going to have a specific um focus on particularly on energy transition I recognize that those are difficult things for community members to join though, particularly because of language barriers. Um, so again, this is where it's really important that we're, that we're working really closely with national coalitions to make sure that we can, uh, that we can engage effectively. Um, so, so that's what I would, I would say just on, on the, the community engagement piece. Um, the question on uh, exchange visits. So I, uh, Again, in, in our plans, I would say for the coming two years, the, the sort of interactions that those exchange visits are trying to foster, they're really captured, I, I would say, under two of our outcomes. So one is under effective partnerships and the other one is under um, connected advocacy. So under the connected advocacy, we're really looking to amplify the work that is happening precisely so that other members can learn from it so that we've got a, a, a real sense of um, uh, being able to replicate strategies and te techniques that have worked in other parts of the network. The way that we're planning to do that at the Secretariat is through 
is through identifying with coalitions where those um, successes are happening, documenting them either in, in stories of change, so written stories or in short videos, and then making those available through the network. Um, I think exchange visits are a great idea, and we're really keen to build those in, particularly in our joint fundraising approaches. So we're just concluding um, a three-year grant that we've been implementing with um, NORAD in Kenya, Iraq, and Lebanon. And as part of that project, there were exchange visits, particularly for the Lebanese and Iraqi coalitions. Um, and, and I know that those are really valuable. So that's definitely something that we would support and encourage building into joint fundraising proposals when we're, you know, when we're able to, to work on those. Um, there is a, a joint fundraising policy of the, of the Secretariat. You can find that on our website as well. Um, so please do, you know, reach out to us where you do see those opportunities, because I think that's where, where we do have, have real specific opportunities to, to support that type of um, learning exchange. Um, Denver, so can, I, we, can we, yeah, can we expect anything on gender? What are the well, plans? Well, I, I wonder if you, you might want to answer that. I mean, you've done sure. a lot of our work leading sure. the gender sure. work, so I'm happy to, to let you speak to that one if you're happy to. Thank you. Sure, yes, I'm happy to, yeah. Um, uh, let me start by sharing that point about the gender work we've been undertaking for the last couple of years in Francophone West Africa. Last week, we've just completed a kind of learning and sharing um, meeting with members from Burkina Faso, Guinea, Senegal, um, about a uh, gender project we've been implementing for the last couple of years. So, uh, but yeah, we're also planning to share out of very interesting things, including our global gender policy and the gender policy action plan in the coming weeks, which is intended to support national coalitions to link through specific activities and indicators that can help to implement that policy. So the action plan will be made available in five core languages that we have in publisher to pay and later in 23, we are also planning to convene the gender champions that have been identified at national level, as well as in our governing bodies for peer learning session and to identify also potential collective action that we can take to advance implementing of the policy. But yeah, be assured that this um, gender policy action plan give you a great opportunities to see what together we can do to foster more feminist um, natural resource governance within the movement and even beyond where our partners who are really keen to support this work on gender. So on Niger, please, um, let me give you just two or three comments um, about how they got ringage in the EITI implementation process. Yes, uh, Fuad asked that question and yes, they, they, they left EITI in seven, in 2017 due to several reasons, including civic space and um, let's say civil society participation as well, which was really challenging. And you remember in 2018, uh, several members from Publisher to Pay have been jailed due to their work and opinions on the governance in, in Niger. But yeah, in 2019, um, the government of Niger decided and then applied for a new process um, that was approved in 2020. But yeah, overall, the comment is that Niger is a rich of natural resources, including uranium and oil. So it's important for civil society um, to advocate so that Niger comes back to the EITI process that at least promote the transparency and access to information relating to the exploitation of those minerals and oil in, in Niger. So that is the, the, the main work civil society did on that is advocacy. And then also we're supporting our members to engage uh, effectively and um, on, the, on, the, on this process to make sure that EITI is implemented efficiently in this country as well. Um, another point relating to the EITI process is how we can make a kind of connection with energy transition uh, maybe, do, do you have any comment on that? How we can put a link between the energy transition work and the engagement with EITI? Yeah, sure. Um, so 
I mean, I, I guess the first thing to say about the energy transition work is, um, you know, the, the, the goal of this one from Publish What You Pay's point of view is to get good outcomes for for resource dependent countries. And, and for, for many years, countries have been told the way to develop is to invest in your extractors industries. And, and now we're in a situation where um, countries have been told to, to wind down fossil fuels and um, uh, and and a, a, a global energy transition, you know, th th potentially threatens reserves, um, and um, and the economy is dependent on these on these fossil fuels. And that's really where publish what you pay is entering. It's we're trying to get ensure that um, these countries de uh, dependent on on fossil fuels um, can move to cleaner energy in a fairer way that strengthens their their economies and. What we really want to see is the uh, the countries that have developed off the back of fossil fuels and and got very very rich from it, taking the lead and 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 really um, not moving the costs of energy transition to um, to developing countries. And that's when we engage with the EITI. That's what we look to do. What transparency do we need um, to be able to make that um, that sort of vision uh, a reality? And crucially. Where uh, the the EITI is currently considering um, amendments to the standard, and and there are a few amendments proposed on energy transition, um, and and many of those um, those calls for changes came out of this this network and and the consultation we did earlier earlier this year. So we're currently working with the EITI board members um, to help um, strengthen the arguments for for those amendments, and and hopefully get some of those implemented into a new standard. And, and that's really about layering, um, finding a base layer of, of transparency that's needed to make good decisions about um, energy transition and, uh, and allow um, civil society, citizens, uh, companies and governments to really understand the reality of the situation um, before uh, making decisions. Um, I, Edwin may have things to add to that because he's already um, uh, very up to speed on this stuff. Thank you, Joe. I, I think one of the key comp uh, components of this is that as we see, you know, as we we look at, we project into the future and we see that uh, the people who are currently, you know, heavily benefiting, I use the word, from fossil fuel um, um, energy generation. Um, I mean, if, if you look at the divide globally, in terms of the inequality, in terms of energy access, you will see that many of these countries who are so heavily resource dependent, especially even for oil, on oil and gas, are not even consuming as much energy that is also, um, you know, that is generating all of the impacts we have on climate change. And as Joe mentioned, when you think about moving into a just energy transition and you look about what is the multilateral framework that would enable these countries who have the least um, utilization right now, right? How do they, how do they get, you know, first of all, make the most of the development of their, the development of their people, but also understanding that continuous reliance on these um, heavy polluters, or you know, will 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 end, will end someday, and what it means for their economy, not just for today, but but for tomorrow. All of these conversations means that you need to carry a lot of people along. And what is the best framework to do this? What is the what is the existing framework to make these conversations happen in a fair and in a just way? Is where we see our members and our, and our network really playing a major role. Now, whether that is the EITI process, whether that is a, another process, whether that is COP process, uh, these are all the options we need to bring together and synthesize and see what is the best framework to make the needs of the people really come to the fore in this transition process. So that's one role that we have to play. It is a challenge, but we continue to uh, you know, study the sector and then know what, what is the best way to get into the sector. Just a quick one on the China um, question, which I know um, you know, it's really getting attention in terms of um, they could, they are dominating or they may dominate and they would want to work with national governments. So ultimately, I would say the role of the national coalitions in determining the extent to which countries are aligned with China, the extent to which countries submit their resources to China, to that extent, we are able to influence the outcome. Because if we determine that 
a fair process, a just process, a transparent and accountable process to the people, you know, takes the order. That is when we are able to see that we, we can get the best from concessions to China as a country or to Chinese companies as, as well. It's ultimately about the ability to organize at the national level because there is no global framework that China uses. China deals with individual countries. They have deals with individual countries. So when we say disclose the deal, for instance, as a campaign, we are hoping that the disclosure will include even Chinese firms. And that itself, within, that, within, within the strength of that process, we're able to get the most out of a Chinese intervention uh, or Chinese engagement in the extractives. So I think we need to engage with all the campaigns that we have right now and then put um, with the peculiarities or the context for each country, be able to bring the issues to the fore and demand this accountability uh, to, the, to, to key multilateral uh, um, frameworks like the EITI. Those are the two uh, interventions I wanted to make before we, uh, we go ahead. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Uh, deux, trois dernières questions auxquelles moi-même je vais apporter des réponses. Uh, sur la question de l'espace civique, uh, vous avez suivi récemment uh, beaucoup de menaces uh, à l'endroit des membres et activistes de ce groupe et autres. Uh, ces derniers jours, tous les secours a élaboré un communiqué qui a été partagé largement par nos membres et nous avons tous um, mobiliser notre soutien à l'endroit de notre camarade et collègue Kay de Madagascar qui a, été, qui a fait l'objet d'interpellations à la police ainsi que d'autres membres. Euh, Quelqu'un a demandé est-ce qu'on peut s'attendre à plus que ça? Mais oui, on peut s'attendre à plus que ça parce que aussi bien les organes de public se couper, notamment le comité de pilotage euh, Afrique et le Conseil mondial dans les années à venir vont ensemble répondre de façon publique aux menaces et harcèlement dont font l'objet nos membres particulièrement. Et dans nos plans de travail aussi pour de si bien 2023 que 2024, nous allons mettre une attention particulière sur les processus de validation ITE qui sont aussi des moments pour nous de, de proposition par rapport à des réformes liées à l'espace civique. Donc, Ça aussi fait partie des plans prioritaires que nous allons mettre en œuvre déjà à partir de l'année prochaine dans le contexte des validations ITE. Dans les pays où nous n'avons pas encore de membres qui sont impliqués directement dans la mise en œuvre de l'ITE, le secrétariat reste toujours disponible à jouer un rôle de coordination, mais aussi à vous mettre en rapport avec beaucoup d'autres organisations qui protègent les droits humains et aussi qui pourront nous permettre, bien sûr, de mobiliser l'ensemble des acteurs de sorte qu'on puisse garantir euh, une activité sûre pour l'ensemble des membres de Filet Secoupé et ses partenaires aussi. Donc, il y a beaucoup d'organisations avec lesquelles nous collaborons pour au moins assurer que l'espace civique est respecté pour y, aussi bien les pays qui mettent en œuvre l'UTE, qui ont l'opportunité de le régler à travers les validations et d'autres espaces, mais aussi les pays qui ne sont pas dans euh, les pays où ils ne sont pas dans l'UTE. Et enfin, par rapport à l'engagement avec les jeunes, oui, évidemment, tous les secours payés est une euh, organisation ou un mouvement, un réseau assez divers où on implique les jeunes, les femmes, où on a fait beaucoup d'efforts ces dernières années en termes de mobilisation, mais aussi les personnes euh, qui, ont, qui ont été marginalisées pour soit des raisons religieuses, ethniques ou sexistes. Euh, et vous comprendrez qu'à travers le projet Social Bonds, Nous sommes en train de mobiliser aussi les autres personnes qui vivent avec un handicap pour voir comment ces personnes sont impactées par ces activités. Même si l'activité artisanale, proprement dit, ne, concerne, ne fait pas partie des priorités dans la vision 2025 que nous avons élaborée, mais toutes les préoccupations qui touchent aux communautés, que ce soit une exploitation responsable des ressources naturelles, transparente, et qui respecte les droits euh, humains constitue une priorité pour les secouper, que ce soit pour les enfants, pour les femmes et l'ensemble des autres individus. Donc, ce sont les commentaires qui ont été ajoutés dans les échanges tout à l'heure. S'il n'y a pas d'autres questions majeures, bien sûr. Maintenant, là, euh, M. Fofana du Mali euh, parle de restitution des sessions de formation. Bien sûr, euh, il y a divers espaces que les secouper offrent en termes de partage d'informations 
si vous avez des rapports, des études aussi, n'hésitez pas à les partager avec nous, que nous pourrons repartager à l'ensemble du réseau. Mais n'oubliez pas que nous avons aussi nos réunions régionales, nous avons telle que la Conférence Afrique, qui sont aussi des opportunités de partage. Si vous avez des dossiers spécifiques, des questions spécifiques que vous souhaiterez partager lors de ces espaces-là, n'hésitez pas, nous restons toujours ouverts pour toutes ces, ces opportunités d'échange. Euh, alors, les prochaines étapes auxquelles nous allons accorder beaucoup plus d'attention, 2023-2024, je viens de le mentionner déjà, l'espace civique constitue une priorité fondamentale pour nous et le restera toujours parce qu'il faut nous garantir un espace sûr d'action. La question de la transition énergétique reste aussi euh, prioritaire pour nous, que ce soit les minéraux de transition, que ce soit la transition énergétique dans le sens de réduction de l'exploitation euh, des, 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 ce qu'on appelle les hydrocarbures, constitue aussi une question à laquelle nous allons accorder beaucoup d'attention. Euh, la question de renforcer le leadership et les droits des femmes dans le secteur extractif reste aussi une priorité. De ce groupe vient de boucler ce qu'on appelle une politique mondiale genre qui favorise effectivement une gouvernance des ressources naturelles sensibles au genre. Et on l'a annoncé tout à l'heure, le plan d'action vous sera partagé et ensemble nous allons faire de l'endemain meilleur pour le renforcement des droits des femmes dans le secteur extractif aussi bien en 2023 qu'en 2024, mais mieux, plus loin que ça. Euh, L'année prochaine aussi constitue euh, deux événements phares. C'est la conférence Afrique de publier ce que vous payez. C'est aussi la conférence mondiale de l'initiative pour la transparence dans les industries extractives. C'est des espaces d'apprentissage, de partage d'expérience, mais surtout de plaidoyer pour nous autres qui constituent une campagne. Donc, préparons-nous pour ces grands événements où nous allons renforcer notre engagement avec l'ITE. Nous allons renforcer notre engagement pour la transparence des contrats à travers la campagne Disclose the Deal, qui nous permettra aussi de veiller à ce qu'il y ait moins de corruption, mais qu'il y ait plus, beaucoup plus de publications exhaustives de tous les contrats. Donc, voici les éléments clairs. Et nous travaillerons en 2023 et 2024, auxquels nous invitons tout le monde aussi à partager leurs expériences pour les prioritaire pour lesquels travaillerons et ensemble on verra comment publier ce qu'on paye pour apporter son appui à tout ça. Donc voici les quelques éléments que nous souhaitions partager avec vous lors de ce webinaire tout en vous réitérant nos remerciements. C'était un plaisir de vous avoir encore. Et merci pour tous les messages en droit du nouveau directeur. Vous êtes très gentil et nous souhaitons plein succès dans sa mission avec toute l'équipe qui se trouve ici. J'en profite pour remercier mes collègues qui ont fait d'excellentes présentations, Stéphanie, sur les résultats. Notre évaluation, les liens sont partagés dans toutes les langues, vous pourrez y accéder. Si vous avez des questions, n'hésitez pas à nous revenir encore une fois. Euh, enfin, nous remercions aussi les interprètes euh, pour le travail, mais aussi ceux qui sont derrière, que vous ne voyez pas, qui travaillent sur la technique, la technologie et tout ce qui est logistique. Nous vous adressons nos remerciements et vous souhaitons Excellente journée pour ceux qui sont en début de journée, excellente soirée pour ceux qui sont en fin de journée aussi. Et à très bientôt dans les prochains jours, on vous reviendra. Et pour ceux avec qui on ne parlera pas, nous souhaitons par anticipation excellente fête de Noël déjà et meilleur vœu. Merci à tous. Merci Dr Edwin, merci Joe, merci Stéphanie, Sassouati qui ont été brillants dans cet échange. Merci à tous. And thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.